Yauntville AVA, technically where we sit here, but we are part of the unincorporated Napa County. I think that that's a great way to put it. Um, it definitely is a bit of insanity, but you know, interestingly in the early 1980s, the vision for Napa Valley was not exclusive to agricultural processing of, of wine or wine grapes. So you know, to be honest, Napa was actually always an agricultural region. Um, agriculture was the primary use of the land. Historically, over the years, it remains a right to farm area. And I would say in the last 40 years, everything has transitioned with an integral focus to winemaking and wine production, but that was not always the case. So at the time in the early 1980s, wine grapes were starting to become um, a dominant crop, but they certainly were not the obvious use of land. And my father did not have a background in wine. He actually did not have any particular knowledge of wine making or wine production at all. And California was really at its infancy in terms of reinvigorating the pre-prohibition uh, sort of association with wine. So although California has always produced wine, there were definitely fits and starts. Mm. And the early 1980s was kind of the burgeoning of people dedicating land with aspiration that that would become a very important economic focus. But it really wasn't until much later um, that, you know, wine, I think, really took over the agricultural industry in the way that we think of it today. To actually get up and started with any wine making, um, if you are in fact a vertically integrated producer where you grow your own grapes, from planting until the actual first release of a red wine, as I'm sure your viewers know, is about seven years. So to actually get any momentum from international claim, I mean, it took a number of years for people to plant, to dedicate the land, to cultivate the land, and they were really making a pretty big and risky decision to say that they would dedicate their land to wine without really knowing whether or not they could produce particularly great wine at all. So even though, you know, somebody won the 1976 Paris tasting, the real question was, you know, is everyone going to be able to see that same success? Napa has always been an incredibly beautiful place, but it was not always filled with vineyards. So certainly, you know, I, w I grew up amongst all agricultural pursuits. And there were a lot more farms focused on animal husbandry. We had a lot of farms focused on different crops, as I mentioned before. And it was, I mean, it was sparsely populated. I think I grew up in a town of population 81. 90% um, of the buildings that exist in Yauntville today were not there. Um, those were all developed much more recently. We start, we didn't have any restaurants. Um, the closest restaurant was a pizza place called The Spot, which is where Dean and DeLuca came in and then left again. So we really didn't have a lot of food options. It, Napa was not a, a culinary destination and it wasn't even really a, a wine destination in the sense that we think of it today. It was not a luxury destination. My dad came when he was in college, he used to call it the filling station because you could drink for free at some of the larger facilities that had been here since the 70s. Mm -hmm. But people didn't think of Napa as a luxury retreat or even a place where you could go and find top quality wines until it was. And then really the entire economy started revolving around how do we brand Napa Valley as a luxury wine destination? How do we brand Napa wines as apart from the other California neighbors? Because we do offer, I think, a very unique product in Napa that, um, you know, people ask all the time, why is Napa so famous? And I think people, even if they don't know a lot about wine, they know about Napa. And there are a lot of really good reasons for that. You know, Napa is one eighth the size of Bordeaux. We produce about 0.04% of the world's wine. And yet Napa is probably one of the only destinations that people can name off you know, the top of their tongue. So Napa has something that is truly unique and that didn't just come from the branding. I think the branding and, and lifestyle really helped build Napa as a very special place despite its size. Oh no, I wanted out probably from the beginning. Um, I was an only child and I grew up, you know, on a 
small road in a small town and we didn't have a school, we didn't have a high school. Um, we had to commute to those locations. My mom couldn't find a job here in Napa because you know, if you weren't in the wine industry or in farming, there really wasn't much for you. So um, I think I wanted bigger, better. I didn't understand why you would get educated or go to college and come back and be a farmer. And ironically, I think that that lifestyle is ultimately what drew me back and just sort of my fond memories of connecting with nature, understanding the life cycle, the seasons, a lot of things that I ended up missing in the city. I, um, I hated, you know, growing up, but I, I think that's a common story, not just in Napa, but across the board that sometimes the things that you realize you love the most are the things that push you to leave and that's when you start to appreciate them. I, I think the community is still very much authentically an agricultural community. Yeah. So to the outside, I think that there's a perception of a luxury destination, but all the people that live here and behind the veneer are still living pretty similarly to how we grew up. Well, as I mentioned, I left Napa and I even bought my ticket out basically, and I was never coming back. And so I, you know, did my darndest. I actually threw a very large party so that my father, um, having come, my father was a captain in the military. He was none too impressed that I threw a large party <laughs> and he told me that I was going to have to go to boarding school and I, couldn't wait. And so I literally found the boarding school that I thought was furthest away from Napa possible. And I ended up going to school in New England. So yeah, you went far. I went far. Had I known that they had international boarding schools, I probably would have gone there. But at 14, I was hoping that I would never come back. And then, um, interestingly enough, my dad during my college years actually made the transition from growing grapes to making wine. And all of a sudden I thought his job became a lot sexier. In my mind, everyone was getting the credit for all the hard work that he was doing. And I wanted to be part of that lifestyle. And of course I had the same vision that I think a lot of consumers do, which is all we do all day is sit around and drink wine. And you know, this is great. And I'm in college and this is fabulous if I could make that my job. So of course, after I graduated from school, I knocked on the door and I said, dad, you know, I'm ready to come to work. What are you going to do without me? I'm your only child. And he was like, well, you know, why would I hire you? You have zero work experience and you spent your entire life poo-pooing farming and wanting to get out of here. And I need you to understand that even though I've started making wine, our job is still the same. You can't make good wine from bad grapes. And so therefore, if you don't like the farming side of it, then that's going to be a problem because yeah. that's still the most important part of your job. And of course, my father also impressed upon me that, you know, you can make the best wine in the world, but if you can't sell it, then it doesn't really matter. Right. And so any product that you make has to have marketability. It has to have some connection to a consumer. You have to have a consumer that wants to buy it. Mm. And how are we going to be different than what was out there in the marketplace? And so, you know, this was in, you know, the early two thousands. And so I decided to work for a large company to understand really what represented most of the wine market mm. and understand what sort of made a small company or small boutique winery distinct because most wine in the world is sold by very large conglomerates and that's just a very different product and it's a very different market. And so if I didn't understand how wine is really sold and the, the general market share, I was never going to fully appreciate, I think, what was special about our product. And so I did that for many years for E&J Gallo. I learned, well, not for many years, I did it for a very short period of time because I actually realized once I got knee deep into selling wine on mass scale that I just wasn't passionate about that story. It had nothing to do, they're an amazing company, they're an amazing family, and they have completely changed um, in a fabulous way the introduction of wine into the market and getting wine to people's homes. And I think that it's really important. It's the gateway to introducing people to wine in a lot of markets. But on the other hand, what I really realized and missed was I wanted to control the entire process. And I wanted to tell the story of a family that moved to Napa, cultivated the land and really made an artisanal product from beginning to end that reflected our family, but also a specific property that we decided to grow 
and, and build together as a family. Mm -hmm. So that was just a very different story and a very different product than what I had been selling. And so of course I said, well, I've learned my lesson. I'm going to come back <laughs> and dad, you're going to hire me now. And of course he was like, no, I'm not ready to hire you. Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm very grateful now at the time that was what I thought was the door shutting. I said, well, if you're not going to hire me now, I'm going to go on and build my career. So I came back, um, and his answer at that time was, you know, I, I'm worried that a lot of children, you know, come back to Napa and they don't, they don't do it because they really want to do it. It is a lifestyle. It is a difficult business. It is hard to make an authentic product, but it's even harder to stand apart. And the world is just getting more competitive and it's getting harder to sell. And so I went outside of Napa. I ended up deciding, you know, I'm going to become a lawyer. I'm going to leave everything behind. And I decided to pursue that, you know, I was going to live out my city dreams and I was going to, you know, become some famous prosecutor on, you know, the real life version of law and order. But I think ultimately what I, what I've learned is that selling wine is about an emotional connection and selling wine is also storytelling right? It's creating that emotional connection for other people, but it's narrating the why this product is distinct and why this product is something that they can, they can really get behind and excited about. And I learned storytelling when I was at the DA's office. A lot of people say that it feels like a very dramatic transition from working at the district attorney's office to selling wine. And ironically, I think that a lot of the skills that I learned as a district attorney ended up really making me a much more successful marketer of our own family product. Because in a lot of ways, wine making and the, sell, the sale of wine has to do with helping people connect emotionally to the product. It's much more than the product itself. A lot of people make really great wine. A lot of people make great wine in Napa Valley and a lot of people make great wine all over the world. But the reason that people connect with a specific product is they, they connect with certain people. Sure. They have an emotional connection with an experience or a fabulous moment that they shared that wine with. And in my mind, um, learning that storytelling and learning how to create a narrative and to connect with people really came from my experience at the district attorney's office where, you know, you're communicating with 12 people who couldn't figure out how to get out of jury duty and they have to make a very important decision about somebody else's life. And they don't necessarily understand the characters or the protagonists and they never lived that life and they weren't there. And so you have to help connect them to the why their decision is so important and also um, help them understand the greater picture. So interestingly enough, I think um, being a trial attorney is about storytelling and I think conveying the attributes of a small family product that comes from a lot of heart and soul is similarly about storytelling. I came back into the business around 2012. My father got sick. And so I was very much in, you know, on the right ladder at work and I wasn't looking back and I wanted to stay in San Francisco. I worked um, under Kamala Harris at the time, who was a little known district attorney, but you could tell that she was going places and she really invested in me and in her team and believed in me. And so there was really no reason to leave. I actually wish, you know, in a lot of ways that I'd been able to see where I was going and who knew, um, you know, I mean, who knew, who knows where I would be, <laughs> where I would be today. But my father got sick and I think, um, where, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, the field about, you know, there's something about farming and there's something about your land that, you know, pulls you back. And sure. when we make wine, it is connected to the family home that I grew up on and the land that, you know, I watched my parents build and, you know, sort of create with their hands. And so the thought of losing that from our family legacy, and I'm an only child. So if I didn't come back, nobody was going to come back. And so when my dad got sick, I think it was really that crossroads of, I don't know if I'm ready to close that chapter of our family and I need to give it a good old college try to see if 
that's something that resonates with me. I hadn't thought about it in a while. It happened very sort of spontaneously. So I came back under some form of duress, um, in a way, but I think, you know, as I look back, I made a promise to myself that I was not going to just come back because I felt an obligation to do that. Although I certainly did feel some level of responsibility to my family to at least try and see if it was something I wanted. But I, but I did promise myself that I was going to create a product that I was really passionate about and that I was going to put my own fingerprint on where that next generation would go. And so just sort of doing what we'd always done or living out my father's dream wasn't really an option because I knew that to sell something and to live this lifestyle, you're all in. And so you have to believe in it. <laughs> Info at Hoops Vineyard or lindsay at hoopsvineyard.com, you'll be able to find me.